right. Happy Tuesday, everyone, and welcome back to another Learning Tech Talks, where we are exploring the landscape of learning tech, amongst many other things. And today, we're talking about team and manager development, but with a bit of a unique flair in that we're tying it to really kind of the human side of things and really the nudging and check-ins along the way. So to help me with that conversation, I'm joined by PNPN Guthrie, and she's the founder and CEO of Emotions. And yeah, well, well, first of all, welcome and thanks so much for joining me, PNPN. Thank you so much, Chris, for having me. Hello, everyone. Yeah. So, you know, getting into this, um, I'm looking forward to the conversation because I think sometimes we have a tendency to over-engineer learning and development and we can make it really complicated. Um, and I, and I think one of the things is I've gotten to know you and your products is trying to simplify some of that stuff. But even before we get into some of this, we can do some light, light icebreaker stuff along the way. So for those of you who are joining in, feel free to comment. I'm curious who's here and where you are in the world, but your background is different. Cause for those of you who don't know the show, I book these things way in advance. So a lot of times it's been quite a while. So when we first chatted, it was a long time ago, and that was not the background you had. So I am actually curious, where are you in the world right now? I mean, San Francisco Bay Area, Silicon Valley. Okay. Okay. All right. So is are you, well, I guess San Francisco, the, compared to the Midwest where I am, the weather I think is better, but it's inconsistent. And when I talk to people who are in the Bay Area, they're like, this isn't like SoCal, you know, type weather. So how, how are things there in, in end of February? Right now it's raining. It's been raining a lot okay. these a few right. days, but generally it's sunny and nice. Uh, we have good nature here. Okay. All right. All right. Well, it yesterday was all rain, which it was a balmy 40 degrees yesterday, but it was all rain. Now today it's actually sunny. It's going to get up to 50. So I'm getting ready to break out my board shorts. Um, great. But so a little bit of your background, because part of the show is getting to know the guests a little bit and where you're kind of where the genesis of this was. So without even jumping straight to the product, mm -hmm. really curious what your background is and how that journey ended up leading to creating a platform on manager and team development. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to talk about that. So you can probably tell from my name is a little bit different. I'm originally from China, a village in China in Guangdong province, uh, South China. And I personally got very interested in the internet because uh, with the internet, then I was able to explore and uh, read about schools in the U.S. and contact professors here. Um, and I came to the U.S. for grad school at Yale. I got my master's in sociology. Okay. I thought that without the internet, I wouldn't be able to do that. So I was interested in doing something with the internet. And I study how social mobility influenced people's psychological well-being at Yale. And then after Yale, I started really? working in tech. Yes. Okay. <laughs> As, uh, have a little bit of the sociology psychology background and then after Yale I started working in tech as a product manager and I was personally really struggling with like leading teams building relationships with managers and colleagues so um and I was interested in doing something with the internet and I was thinking what kind of product could to build maybe one area is to build the product to help myself and not other people in similar struggles um and I worked in tech and progressed in my career as a product lead at companies like Ticketmaster, Priceline, GoDaddy. Uh, and before I found Emotions uh, two years ago, I was the director product at another startup. So I, my background came from a lot of the consumer facing product uh, management, okay. uh, plus the sociology, psychology. So um, so that's- So I'm actually helped. really curious yeah. in this because again, this is unrelated to the product piece, yeah. but I'm actually really curious the, so you went into associate, did you know, did you have an inkling that, I mean, obviously you the internet changed your life dramatically, yeah, right? but then you went into sociology and really studied kind of the human behavior, psychology yeah. of people. Right. As you were going through that, did you get an indication that, you know what? I actually think there's really something to this mix between the two. Um, uh, I, no, I, I think it's like, like it wasn't a natural, like I'm going to work in tech and build a tech platform. There wasn't that it didn't immediately hit you. No, I, I mean, part partly is at school, you learn certain subjects, but you don't know what you're going to do in the workplace and yeah. <laughs> how you apply it. And um, partly is like, 
I think it's more after started working in tech and then I kind of had my personal experience and it's like, okay, maybe I can do something in this space. And also it's like the leadership skills, people skills, we didn't really get to learn in, even though I got a few masters, um, we didn't get to learn these at school. So I was like, well, uh, what is some, one thing I can do to uh, make impact on people's lives? Um, I didn't really think of how can I use like the knowledge, but it just came to come together. So I want to talk about this a little bit. We we're, we are going to get to the product, I promise. But your your background, I think, isolates an issue that happens a lot, which I think is worth talking about. Kind of the problem at hand, because here mm-hmm. you you come over from China, you go to Yale. Mm-hmm. You're, you're educated in psychology at like one of the best schools in the States. Mm -hmm. And then you go into the workforce and you get put into a managerial role (laughs) and like school did not prepare you for that. Is that, (laughs) is that a reason you're like, uh, now I'm actually responsible for managing all of this. And nobody really taught me how. (laughs) Right. Yeah. So I was tasked with like leading a team of uh, senior engineers and plus designers. And (laughs) and it's like, it's all learning by uh, kind of doing learning by making mistakes. And partly it's like, well, it's actually, it's painful when those mistakes happen. Is there anything I can do to help uh, reduce some of the pains that myself and other people would feel if, if they're coming kind of tasked with becoming a leader manager without any prior trainings. Well, and I think that's, that's really hitting at the point of what I think a lot of people experience in this. I mean, that was my experience similarly was it's like here, because what were you, what were you like, as you stepped into your first managerial role, I love painting this picture as you were stepping into your first managerial role, what were you leading people over? Like, was it, was it an area you were deeply an expert in or not really? (laughs) It's a lot of learning uh, new things. So uh, I studied social science and then suddenly I worked in this internet company tasked with building a new whole new e-commerce platform, um, (laughs) partnering directly with the CTO and some senior engineers and uh, plus outside vendors. You're dealing with highly technical people (laughs) and you're managing things with highly technical people, which was not necessarily, even though you... Had a right. You had a, some digital acumen. That wasn't your subject matter expertise. No. Yeah, I I did quantitative research. I know how to do market research. I know how to do quantitative analysis. But I had to learn all the new lingos. Like, okay, what does system architecture design mean, and all those technologies. Right. Yeah. And now on top of it, not only are you trying to learn this. I mean, again, I'm just painting the picture of what a lot of managers yeah. get thrown into. On top of having to try and figure this out yourself. Yeah. You're now also responsible for leading those teams and their performance, even though you're kind of learning the ropes at the same time. That's right. Is that fair? Yeah. And also coordinating um, a lot of stakeholders. A lot of uh, people have their own opinions. So like how do you get everyone together, aligned um, towards building something in the same direction? That's right. The, yeah. Yeah. And And again, I think this is one of the things that, I mean, so, so here's some of like my experience, my, my experience was similar when I first stepped into one of my lead roles, right. I'd been doing kind of my jam as an individual contributor for a bit. And they were like, Hey, why don't you take on these additional responsibilities Mm -hmm. and lead other people at the same time, Mm -hmm. which sounds like, okay. I mean, I guess that sounds fine. I can probably figure this kind of thing out, but there's some tough lessons of going into this and nobody really teaches you the ropes in many regards. I mean, I, I know I didn't get any sort of real guidance or training on how do you lead people? It was just kind of like, here you go. Yeah. Take care of this stuff. I'm curious. (laughs) What were some of your hard lessons that actually led you to go, this is really hard and we need to do something about it. That's it. Are That's a great that question. Out? Yes. Uh, <laughs> early on in my career, uh, I would sometimes I was kind of getting into a heated discussion with oftentimes the engineering manager, like a counterpart that I had. And then right. I would argue for quite a bit of time and it ended up as upsetting people and maybe damaging relationships. Um, and I learned it the hard way. Uh, sure. And I mean, now I, I, I'm still friends with some of <laughs> some of them, unfortunately, but it, it was a waste of time, like an hour of heated debates and not leading anything. 
And what I thought was like, what if I could have an AI virtual coach that can tap me and say, hey, calm down, take a deep breath um, and okay. kind of try to listen and understand instead of like, uh, instead of getting in uh, into yeah. an angry mode and argue and um, kind of hurt hurt everyone um, and damage okay. the time. So yeah, that okay. was kind of like a, a spark up idea um, of thinking like okay. maybe one thing I can do. Yeah. Well, and I mean, again, you, you learn some of these things through the road of hard knocks, but like, I just even think from my experience, you know, when you've been, so I was, mine was a little bit different in that I ended up leading things that I had run before. So like one mm -hmm. of my biggest challenges was I used to do this. Now I'm responsible for leading other people to do it. And then that tendency is to be like, well, no, do it like me, mm -hmm. <laughs> do it yeah. like I would type of a thing, which the common ground between that with what you described and what I described is it's relational in nature. Like in yours, yeah. you had this relationship and here you're creating conflict instead of going, Hey, can we just like listen to each other? Mm -hmm. And I was dealing with the same thing where it was like, no, you're not doing it right. Cause that's not how I would do it. Yes. And it's like, well, this is creating conflict because now these people that I'm supposed to be leading and inspiring are going, mm -hmm. I'm not you. I'm not you. Stop trying to make me you. But all this stuff comes back to mm -hmm. you're dealing with people and people get really messy really quick. Yes. I, I actually heard it, uh, heard about this, uh, one of the top challenge that uh, managers, for, especially first time managers have is delegation and um, kind of how to trust the team and, and their direct reports to do things instead of micromanaging. Um, so hear this struggle yeah. from other people as well. Yeah. So then, okay. And then we're, and then I want to get to how that led to the product piece, but mm -hmm. so then how did, as you were going through this, cause you've had all this background in, uh, you know, mm -hmm. social psychology and all of this, mm -hmm. how did you end up seeing, how did you end up translating some of that before you even got to the product to, mm -hmm. as you're a manager, when you started connecting the dots, what were some of those dots you connected where you're like, you know what? I learned a lot about this. This actually isn't just theory and academic, this actually applies in the work that I'm doing as well. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I think a lot of that comes down to relationship building and managing okay. our own emotions and other people's emotions and understanding um, our own psychology reaction and uh, other people's psychology reaction. Um, and when, our, when, it, when we are in the middle of uh, kind of heated heated discussions or or sometimes people call it emotional hijack. It's act, even if I know the theory, I still get into that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got all the head knowledge to be like, okay, this is this is what's happening. My my emotions yeah. are being hijacked. I'll, yet you're still getting just as sucked into it. Right. So it's uh part is like, okay, well, we can't just wait when when we are in the middle of um, kind of almost <laughs> fighting with somebody to to yeah. think about doing things. Is there anything we we should start practicing doing daily? So when we end in this specific situation, we can then kind of at least remind ourselves, hey, here's what you can do to um, to uh, stay calm or to what here are the phrases words you can use to ask open ended questions um, instead of being defensive. So is things that we can practice uh, daily so that we can bu gradually build the muscle. It's like going to a gym, like we need to do it every day instead of waiting to like, oh, yeah. now I'm suddenly overweight, let's go now. Yeah. Right, right. Well, and I think that's a really important piece when we think about some of this stuff, because a lot of times when we think about, you know, how do we want to change behavior? We think about mm -hmm. like the spark. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, well, what's the spark that starts the fire type right. of thing? But a lot of times we forget that like it that's not actually how all this behavior change happens. So it's interesting hearing kind of your academic background connect to, hey, okay, I can know all this stuff in my head, mm -hmm. but if I wait till I'm pissed off and in an argument with my coworker, mm -hmm. it's a little bit late for me to kind of try and walk this back through academic theory mm -hmm. and try and get myself to calm down because well, it's too late. My emotions have been hijacked and I'm off the rails type of a thing. I should have been doing this much sooner to your point mm -hmm. of more of a daily practice around this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
exactly. And and also like, I mean, there are some basic knowledges that that we do need to learn um, that we we might not have learned in academic environment. Like we were never taught like, okay, here's how you can ask more open ended. Uh, coaching type of question instead of giving instructions. Those are things what, that we still need to learn. But then after learning that, then how do you apply to your daily life? And need to okay. we need to figure out like how we can. I can I can quickly show you <laughs> how we incorporate it into the product as well. Sure, sure, yeah. I mean, well, because so let's. I'm trying to think how best to to thread this in. Well, yeah, actually, let's let's jump to this one. Because what I want to talk about here, hang on, I'm, I'm just making a little note of the time, um, is there's two tiers, if I'm understanding you correctly. Mm-hmm. And I think this is an important distinction. There's the knowledge piece, which yes. is there are definitely certain managers. And probably if I were to think back deeply, there was when I first stepped into a managerial role, there were things that I just cognitively didn't know. Like you said, mm-hmm. like hey, how do you ask open-ended questions instead right. of closed-ended? Oh, you know, I, I didn't even understand that framework or yeah. things like that. But there's a difference between, I know this in my head, just like you had a graduate degree from Yale mm-hmm. and actually doing it. And there's a difference between, oh, I know it and now I actually know how to do it. And I think if I'm hearing you correctly, that's a really important distinction that we need to make. And I call it knowledge acquisition versus mm-hmm. knowledge application, where it's like, well, yeah, it's one thing to acquire this head knowledge. It's another thing to put it into practice. That's right. Yeah. it's uh, It takes a lot of practice <laughs> to actually master some of these things. Um, and I believe it's a kind of lifelong learning process. Um, okay. Even the, the best, some of the best psychologists I talk to or uh uh, leaders I talk to, um, everyone's still saying like they, they're still practicing some of these things. Um, okay. Okay. So I want to get to the show, the part of that, but while we do, so is that really, as you set out to say, Hey, I think I want to solve a problem in this space. Was that really what you were looking to do for managers is say, I want to be able to not only help you be more cognitively aware of the things mm-hmm. that you need to do as a manager, but then also give you the tools to actually be able to apply and get better at using those skills. Is that a reasonable summary? That's right. Yeah. So it's giving people the the tools so that they can, they can apply what they learn. I mean, besides learning the knowledge, apply what they learn and continue to be better. We, uh, we can help the managers. We can also help um, cross-functional teams who need to collaborate a lot. We can also help um, people who interact with like customers. For example, people facing rows could any <laughs> any job that deals quite a bit with other human. I think could okay. use some of some of these practices. Okay, so let me pull it up then, so that we can talk a little bit about it, sure. because that I think that's an important piece when we think about okay, well, there's there's actually a fair amount of complexity when we think into this human behavior around okay, mm-hmm. if we're asking you to not only just know something, because I mean, if we want just somebody to know something, we can we can push some content, but it's this: how do you get into this? As you said earlier, this daily behavior of mm-hmm. change, right? Um, so this is one of the example practice that um, that we do. Um, we ask people what kind of skills you want to learn. So emotional intelligence could be one of them. Um, and we ask people what kind of role are you? Are you first time manager? Are you director? Um, are you IC? Uh, and then from there, we can recommend the right kind of practice that people can do. Um, so Christopher, how are you feeling now? Me? Well, you know what? I'm excited. I'm like in a good mood. That's great. Um, why are you excited? Because we're talking about the intersection of people, technology, and performance. <laughs> That's great. Um, so w- these are designed to be getting people to tap into their uh, how they're feeling, helping people develop the self-awareness, understanding why they're feeling a certain way. Um, and then we ask, like, how would you change or maintain that kind of feelings? And then we also ask people, what is your top challenge? So we can help people connect the emotions with their, their daily challenges. Um, what is your top challenge? Oh, man. 
Is it a multi-select? <laughs> <laughs> Pick one right let's now. Let's do Let's do handling changes. Let's stick with handling changes for right now. Great. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there's so much going on in the society, economy, um, things happening in other countries or in the US. So it's a very common thing. So um, so you can you can review the answers to the practice you just you just did um, as a way to help you develop the self-awareness. You can also review okay. in the past like how you um, how you felt in different so days. So you can actually start trend. to get a pulse on how have you been doing to see, is this a trending thing? Did I just have a bad day? That's or right. Or is this, is this a season where, holy cow, for the last six weeks, I've been stressed back to back yes. to back to back. That's right. And then, and then you can also browse some of these. This is the knowledge acquisition part. So uh, browse some of these resources that's recommended for you on like, how to handle change, for example, or other uh, topics. Okay. And I saw after you're doing this personal reflection, it's mm -hmm. it's recommending something to you saying, hey, based on how you're feeling and what you're struggling with right now, here's mm -hmm. something that's relevant to you. Is that is that fair? That's right. Yeah. So after after you have done the practice, we recommended the right video for you to watch. And then you we also recommended other practices that you can do more on okay. um on the different topics that you're interested in for example like as a leader um we can also think about um as we as we handle changes and situations like how do we um how do we cultivate the psychological safety environment for people to talk about change for example um that's another okay. part of it. And then we're, we're incorporating AI. And in the practices. So I'm, so I'm even looking at this from a, from mm -hmm. a, I'm going to, I'm going to take the, I'm going to go back to just the two of us talking here for a minute. Mm -hmm. But what you're doing with some of this, if I'm understanding this is also helping them with the reflection piece of this. Cause That's it's right. one thing to say, Hey, here's a video on how to manage your team through a difficult change. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. Now I've acquired some new knowledge, perhaps maybe not, but then, okay, you actually need to reflect and think on that. So it's also designed to help them actually have those moments of reflection to think about think about what it is they're actually doing. Yes, it's helping p cultivating the habit of uh, self reflections, daily reflections. Um, besides okay. providing the uh, right resources for them. Okay. Um, and we're we're cultivating a community as well, so they can if after the self reflection they can talk to other uh, leaders, peers, or even like experts and um, certified coaches, other people as well. So I want to talk, I want to talk about this piece because I think this is a really important one. There's actually two that you just brought up there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hit this one first and I think we're going to, then I'm going to bring us back to another one. But even your first question is an emotional question. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling right now? Right. Which... I, it makes sense to me and given yeah. your background, it makes perfect sense. But I think in many organizations and really even just people in general, we've in many ways been taught to not let, not bring our emotions to work, yes. right? Like leave your emotions at the door. We don't talk about emotions. Feelings aren't something that we deal with at work. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually not going to share my point of view on this because I'm actually really curious your point of view because you went into grad school at Har or Yale on this one. Because to me, that's a really distinct thing that oftentimes gets missed in our space is we don't really like talking about feelings. We mm -hmm. kind of leave emotions out of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I still hear that. I think it's still some, <laughs> some leaders do tell me corporate Americans don't talk about emotions. Um, but with the pandemic, with so many people um, getting burned out and experiencing isolation, um, even people don't talk about it. It's, it's still like, there's still emotions. Well, that's what I'm on. saying with your background in this. <laughs> I would love your take on like why we should, because I'm, I'm in full support of it. Quite frankly, right. when I hear people talk about emotions, yeah. like leave those at the door. It's like, are you kidding? We're people. <laughs> you don't, <laughs> you're an emotional being. There's yeah. no denying that. And you can't just turn that off because you, you showed up yeah. at work today. But I'm curious how you've seen that 
play into some of this because I have to imagine that actually tapping into people's emotions in some ways you do it in a very light and friendly way. Mm-hmm. But I think it's an important piece to focus on because a lot of times we don't like to talk about that. Even the question, how are you feeling today? I would say a lot of managers don't realize the power in even asking mm-hmm. that question to their direct reports. Yes. Yeah, that's very much true. I think it's partly because we were we did not learn some of the vocabulary. Uh, a lot of time, like up- upbringing, my parents didn't talk much about emotions with me. I'm from... China and like well, we talked before we went live that culturally there's big cultural differences That's from different right. areas. So I was going to ask, you know, did you grow up having a really emotional? You were in tune with your emotions. You talked a lot about all of this, or was that kind of foreign? Uh, it's it's all new. Like I have to learn everything new. Um, I, it's like I did not learn how to manage emotions. I did not learn how to. I mean, you see the symptoms of someone yelling, but you don't know like what what's is going the, on what's going on or how to ask questions to understand why and um, how to, how to help give like suggestions to how to manage that when there's emotional outbreak and things like that. Um, I mean, there have been some research that shows that um, emotional intelligence, people having higher uh, emotional intelligence can have better relationships, both socially and also at work. They have higher performance, especially for people facing roles. Uh, and and teams having emotional intelligence can improve productivity. So there's some research um, kind of tie the managing emotions with the team performance part besides the psychological well-being, like people have higher uh, emotional intelligence can also have uh, better mental well-being. And when people have better, better uh, mental well-being, they're more productive. Um, so, okay. so these are all kind of, tied to together. Well, and it's, it's funny you bring this up because, um, you know, it is, I think this is a really important thing just for learning leaders in general, as we think about Mm -hmm. the things that we're doing, you know, the past few years have really, not only have we started integrating things like our emotions at work, but even just Mm -hmm. our personal life at work. And some of the things that are suddenly coming together and becoming more integrated where we go, this idea that we're, these compartmentalized creatures that can turn things on and off. It's like, it doesn't really work that way, but it's interesting. You bring some of these things up because even the vocabulary around Mm -hmm. feelings, um, oftentimes we don't even necessarily really have the vocabulary to describe what's going on. And I think that point of the reflection is a really important piece on that because sometimes our vocabulary is oversimplistic. I'm angry. Well, are you angry or are you irritated or are you frustrated or right? There's different categories of this kind Mm -hmm. of stuff that can mean very different things and being in tune with, well, what's actually really driving this. Mm -hmm. And if you're irritable, right, that's a different, that's a different level of, Oh, okay. And now how is that feeling connected to the way I'm showing up in this relationship, the way I'm approaching this situation. Mm -hmm. But if you're not taking the time to think about that, you really are lacking significantly as you think about the relationships you bring to work and especially Mm -hmm. as a people leader. Yes. Yeah. So developing the self-awareness is super important. Like uh, to some extent, we need to be able to manage ourselves and be calm um, so that we can be a better interface with, with other people. Now we're thinking about how to incorporate things like AI to, to give people suggestions and, and, using AI to detect when someone is, is getting upset uh, based on the things that they write or uh, the things that they talk about. But AI can help to some extent that humans do need to master these skills uh, of understanding themselves and then kind of like leveraging the right tools for them to right. to, to calm themselves or calm other, calm other people so that they can kind of come back to a more productive uh, discussions or, or debate about certain work topics. Well, and it's, it's funny you bring this, and then I want to talk about this AI piece. Um, but I just even can think from my own personal experience, mm-hmm. when you're able to process your emotions and recognize what they are, not deny them, but actually recognize what they are and what's driving them. It does to your point, help get you to a different place where you're Mm -hmm. able to approach things differently because you're able to at least acknowledge, okay, this is how I'm feeling. This is what's going on and what's contributing to that. So at least you can see it rightly. 
Mm -hmm. and recognize, okay, I may be approaching this situation through a different lens because I know this is what's mm -hmm. going on and how I'm feeling and how I'm responding. So I can either counter that and make sure that I'm not letting that overpower the way I'm coming into a situation. Or sometimes even just being able to acknowledge where you're at from a feeling standpoint mm -hmm. actually can release some of the tension that comes with it. Because you're like, okay, there. Right. right? Like, I mean, I just even think of some of the hard lessons I learned as a people manager early on where even acknowledging what your feelings are to your team mm -hmm. can help them go, okay, right? We're, we're seeing a different version of Christopher, but it's yes. not because he hates us or something. I did something wrong. He's feeling a certain way. And so he's acknowledging it and he's bringing that out. And I think sometimes that level of vulnerability is really uncomfortable for people. Yes. I heard that um, it's uncomfortable, it, but it's also helpful because you're setting a good example now that people are feel like, okay, since Christopher talk about how they feel now, I can talk about what I feel like a project could be stressing me out. It's too difficult, things like that. So they they will be more likely to open up. And so you can know what what they're experiencing. You can help them uh, unblock things. So that that helps to some um, kind of it in smoothing out, um, making progress with with project and work as well. Well, and I think that point that you made right there about why it's important for managers, right? What you're describing and what you're helping managers do. It's not just improving the manager's well-being and mm -hmm. their health because it it has a ripple effect. That's right. If we're helping managers be more in tune with their emotions and how their emotions are affecting them and yeah. more aware of what these emotions are and the reflections on how is this shaping mm -hmm. the way I'm approaching things, again, you're setting the tone for that team to go, hey, my boss is being more in tune and aware of this. That means mm -hmm. I can, right? You're building trust to say, well, that allows me to open some of these things. So in many ways, you're actually having a positive effect on the whole team, even by affecting that one person. That's right. And also it's especially important in the hybrid and re remote environment because we, uh, we're not sitting in an office right next to each other. It's harder for us to notice what someone is experiencing unless we kind of make a, a deliberate effort to uh, to observe or or ask in, in a way that kind of make them feel safe to talk about certain things. And sometimes it's, it's just that it needs to start from us. Um, yeah. So that, so that it's... Well, it's and like, I think that your point about the hybrid workplace, your, your point about it needing to be more intentional mm -hmm. is such a really important piece because again, when you're only seeing people behind a screen, we already were really bad at mm -hmm. bringing our emotions to work. And not right. that we didn't bring them. We still brought them, but they were dysfunctional and we didn't necessarily have a name for what we were dealing with. Yeah. But at least you were in proximity to that person that you saw them throughout the day versus now in a hybrid world, <laughs> if, you, if you and I had a meeting and I blew up at you in a meeting and you had no context for what that was, and then that was the only interaction you had with me the rest of the day, you're filling in all those gaps about who I am and what I'm bringing to the table that mm -hmm. may not be based on reality. That may have been a window that you saw into me for a very short period of time. And that's a really important call out. Yes, especially with so much kind of going on also in personal lives. Um, someone might act like really upset and pissed off. And then you think of like, oh, did I do something wrong? But actually it could be something happening at home. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> so it's like kind of being able to be uh, noticing these things and, and kind of separating um, separating our assumptions with like what if we observe yeah. would be helpful. Yeah. And I think this all just comes back to bringing some of this stuff to the forefront where historically we've pushed it to the back and been like, mm -hmm. oh, let's try and avoid this. But if anything, that need has always existed. I would say more than ever though now. Mm -hmm it's even more because I mean, your example just made me chuckle, you know, because there, I, I can think of specific times where I've had to get up and do something. One of my kids, well, right before we went live, my girls were in an argument over something mm -hmm. that was going on in Minecraft. <laughs> that brings a level of emotion to me that mm -hmm. then comes into the conversation that you may not know about you know, type of a thing, but you may not always see that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think the ability to start breaking down the walls of, listen, we're emotional beings. We need to be in tune with this. Do you ever, 
I, I am curious about this. Do you ever see, because it sounds like from your experience, people are getting better at that. Is that fair? Are people kind of getting better at acknowledging that emotions have a role in work? I Actually, that's a question for you. Um, that's a great question. I think it depends on... Okay. Um, I, what I heard from talking to uh, leaders at different companies, there's a generational difference. Uh, some okay. generations are more comfortable, actually more outspoken about how they're feeling. And uh, there are some some other generations that are a little bit more reserved and uh, less comfortable talking about things. So there's there's a way we can kind of bridge the generation generational gap um, to help the generations that maybe grew up less uh, comfortable or less accustomed to talking about feelings uh, versus the young generations that might go on TikTok to to kind of tell the <laughs> world how they're feeling, um, but they, but they might not come to the meeting with with a, a manager that's a different generation to talk about their feelings. So it's like how how do we kind of help people be aware that okay, uh, in the future work uh, with more automations and and things going on then the, the things remaining are uh, the humans, the jobs that right. like humans need to be more in tune with other humans. So what makes human different is some of the feelings and emotions and um, things like that. Okay. Well, the generational difference, it's, and then I want to get to this tech piece because you, you just said something that I want to unpack a bit. Yeah. But yeah, I have to imagine this whole conversation around emotions and work, it's, and we're talking about doing it well. And I think that's the really important part. There's a way that you can do this well, and there's a way that you can do this dysfunctionally. Mm. Because I can see to some folks perceiving the idea of emotions coming to work as, like you said, what we, we don't need everybody on TikTok, like having a you know feelings sharing session at the beginning of every meeting. That's No, that wouldn't be productive either, right? right. That wouldn't necessarily be a productive way to get work done. And mm. that would be one extreme of it. The other extreme would be the, I want to pretend as though nothing that's happening in your life is affecting you emotionally. So just turn that off type of thing. You've got these two extremes and it's about saying, how are we helping people better understand? And, and that generational difference would be a significant reason why I, re I read an article recently that we've got now five generations mm -hmm. in the workforce. And I have to imagine that you're seeing some of this where how people perceive emotions is vastly different across those generational lines. I hate making stereotypes, but I have mm -hmm. to imagine there's distinct differences just based on cultural stuff. Yes. Um, I, I think cultural upbringing uh, has a fact, generational environment has a fact. And then also the environment of the economy and the companies. Like now there are some companies doing layoff and then uh, some companies are cutting costs and they're trying to do more with less people or do more with less resources than people are under pressure. They were like, okay, we have to produce these results. So when people are under pressure, it's easy for them to like, okay, let's just go, go, go do this project. Have you done this? Why, why is Hassan not done? And it's easy to, for people to j just get into the kind of like, let's just do a task phase and project phase. Um, but, but then if we are not tapping into what other people is feeling uh, and kind of, helping them feel safe and calm, then even, even if you, we want people to progress faster and, and achieve things, they, they're still in the fear mode. Like how can we kind of turn things around and, and help them be kind of feel comfortable. So they more just self-motivated and self-driven. Okay. Well, yeah, cause we have, and Sam, I see your question. I'll bring this one up here in a second, but right. That's an important consideration that we also have to make. Um, I actually recently created some uh, kind of additional content on YouTube about this, mm -hmm. that, yeah, when, when companies are in economic downturns mm -hmm. or when you're experiencing significant layoffs, the emotions people bring to work, that may not be their norm. I just think back to your, your example of the mm -hmm. calendar, right? Suddenly mm -hmm. you went from days being happy, happy, normal, you know, okay, okay. To suddenly stressed, overwhelmed, mm -hmm. anxious, you know, every single day, you're now bringing a different emotional, which changes really in many ways, even the lenses that you're looking at situations. So something that you may have looked at two weeks ago that you would have been like, oh, that's totally fine. Not a big deal. 
-hmm. Suddenly you're looking at that going, this is the end of the world. This obviously means, you know, things are bad, you know, type of a thing. And you have to get around that. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's like you said, one of the top challenges handling changes. So, um, there are a lot of changes that could be out of our own control. Then in that situation, what can we control is partly ourselves, like our emotions and our thoughts and feelings. And, and maybe we can yeah. also help other people to view situations in a little bit more positive way as well. Right. Well, and I think this, um, actually, I'm going to bring Sam's question up and then we can continue this one. But as you've looked at kind of the emotional side of things, you know, we're talking about obviously the generational piece, cultural has a huge impact. I remember that was an eye opening moment for me when I worked in my first global organization and seeing the differences between the, the Asian Pacific region and Europe. And I, and you're like, Whoa, there are major culture differences. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the way different cultures handle emotions. Mm -hmm. Do you see some of this stuff? I can share my experience as well, but I'm curious since you're doing this a lot more, do you see any differences even across like functional lines where yeah. in certain functions, they're much more comfortable talking about their emotions and other ones? It's like, yeah. uh, -uh. <laughs> I, I, uh, yes, I, I do hear, um, things and, um, have seen this patterns. Um, we'll have more data to show once we get more people to uh, to be using our product and aggregate the data set. Um, okay. Right now, what we observe is, um, for example, like people who come from techni technical uh, backgrounds, like finances, right. I mean, we can consider as analytical background, uh, yeah. engineering background, um, and scientists, for example. Uh, what I heard and, and I personally experienced observe um, in the workplace um, is they are less likely to talk about emotions. They feel less comfortable sure. talking about these things. They might not even think of talking about it or might not have the vocabulary to talk about it. So it's actually yeah. really hard <laughs> from my own experience. Like they might be upset, but you don't know why they're upset. And, and you have to like read very carefully to notice they're upset. <laughs> they might not tell you they're upset. <laughs> um, and even if you ask, are you upset? They may not even answer the question directly. That's right. Um, so, so it's like, th there are some different, there are some um, people who might be a little bit more um, trained in like customer service, for, for example, like they, they probably trained in kind of noticing whether customers upset and, and they have some of those understanding to some extent. Um, okay. And, and also I can see that even in like customer service or something like that, where they're mm -hmm. used to engaging with customers and kind of reading mm -hmm. tone and language and trying to understand and knowing how to deescalate where I can see where some of these other functions that are highly technical or like you said, analytical, that may be speaking Greek. It may just be a completely foreign language. Yeah. I mean, even myself, I came from a quantitative research background. So it's like, <laughs> I had to learn a different type of uh, vocabulary and dealing with uh, humans and leading teams, that kind of things as well. And culturally, I also heard that um, South America, uh, people from South America are more expressive. Um, and that, Oh, I mean, again, I hate to stereotype because to me, stereotypes are, they're incomplete and it's not yeah. like, oh, anybody here. But I would say I, have, I would completely agree with that as my interaction with the South American region. It is much more socially normative to yeah. be very dynamic and bring your emotions to work. And, and again, does that mean everybody is? No. But what I would say is I saw those kinds of trends where, and again, like I said, Asian Pacific region, it was not as much. Okay. You didn't really bring up emotions and feelings mm -hmm. um, nearly as much and being aware of those cultural differences, which then you add the complexity of, well, now we got different functions. So you've got people mm -hmm. from different regions, different generations, mm -hmm. all intermixing together in some of these different functions going, how do we help them navigate this emotional complexity? Mm -hmm. On that one, how do you help people connect the dots between this? Because I do think there's some real merit behind this, but I know over the years, I've even run into challenges with this we're helping people understand that emotions aren't this squishy, <laughs> you 
you know, not important because sometimes I've even heard it. Well, we're really focused on performance. We're not really concerned about some of these softer things. And it's like, mm. no, actually they're the same thing. <laughs> they, they aren't different. Have you had anything that's helped people kind of move forward in changing their thinking around that? Um, that's a good question. I, so I think it's partly for leaders to understand um, performance and projects are done by people and people yeah. have, um, have, have the analytical part uh, and then have the emotional part. Um, I am re reading a book about kind of brain, uh, brain science and okay. It's called like one part of the brain is more kind of analytical, logical. The other part is more like emotional. Uh, okay. and, and we have to understand that um, for a, someone to be functionally uh, functional in, a, in the highest capacity, those, those two need to be connected and kind okay. of working in the, in the right direction. So by disconnecting them, we're actually reducing a person's capability because if I'm hearing you correctly, when we try and separate those two as if they don't interact with each other, a person actually cannot function well. Is that is that fair? Uh, the, yeah, so for, for someone to be like a, a well-functioned person, um, we actually have to, <laughs> uh, based on what I read about the brain science, it's actually need to start from childhood to help kids to kind of <laughs> <laughs> bring, bring those two together. But what if, what if our parents did not know about these things? Right. Yeah, our parents didn't know about the brain science because, yeah, you could hear this and go, okay, well, great. I got a bunch of people on my team who did not get that in their childhood. Yeah. So it's not, it's not, it's over. But again, ideally to yeah. any of the parents as a father of seven, this is a big <laughs> deal to me because it's like, you got to teach kids this at a young age, ideally. I mean, I talk with my kids every night about, yeah. hey, what happened today? How did it make you feel? That's like right. that is one of our exercises that every night we talk about what happened That's and how right. it made us feel to start connecting the dots between, Hey, how did that feeling shape the way you perceive the situation? But this is something that to your point, so this is where I want to let you continue on this. A lot of us didn't get that as a kid. I mean, I didn't. Yeah, yeah my, me neither. And I have, I have a nine month old and two year old now. So, and I kind of consciously trying to help them build some of these muscles, but it's not too late. We can still do that as, as adults, um, and based on uh, some of the top world's top uh, kind of psychologists' research on some of the emotional regulations and emotional intelligence, it, it is a muscle that we can build. Um, it's it's yeah. an ability that we can learn it by continuing. So good news, practice. folks. <laughs> 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 don't don't worry. We don't need to go back to blame up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it just needs continuous practice and kind of uh, ha having the conscious efforts to do these things. Okay. Well, which is what, you know, just even quickly, I'll quick bring this back up again. But that's that's what you're trying to do through mm -hmm. this is say, listen, we recognize most yeah. of you, probably most people did not have that experience where mm -hmm. they got the practice and the the wiring to say, here's what's happening. Here's how my emotions connect to that. Here's how my feelings tie to it. Again, mm -hmm. as this interconnected, interwoven thing, most people mm -hmm. didn't have that. And so part of it sounds like your desire because of your background was to say, mm -hmm. well, it doesn't mean you're doomed. Yeah, there we go. That's the one, right? Mm -hmm. Starting to help people go, well, let's first be intentional about reflecting on how mm -hmm. are you feeling? Like, it's okay to mm -hmm. think about that and process that and reflect on that. Then let's connect that feeling mm -hmm. to why? Like what has led you to feel that way so that you can start to process these things in a healthy, productive way, and then mm -hmm. connect that to, okay, how does that end up tying to your work mm -hmm. and all of that kind of thing? So I think your point of this is really what you're trying to do is help bridge the gap between emotions and performance because they aren't two separate things. They're two interconnected things that ultimately drive. And it's something that happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Not something you do once, just like you don't mm -hmm. go to the gym once and say, I lifted weights today. That's right. Am I good? Like, no, you do this every day. Yeah. So 
we get people to practice this, build a habit, um, and also apply these in daily interactions with the teams and colleagues and friends and family and customers, so that it, yeah. the as you mentioned, that ripple effect can, can um, go to other people. And we intentionally make it so easy to use that anyone can sign up and can try our product for free. Uh, and if they want more, they can they can access the subscription. But yeah, uh, but. The daily practice they can use for free every day um, for to cultivating some of these muscles um, and and also kind of how to apply some of these as a leader uh, in or as talking about your, with your team like how do we get teams to open up to talk more about okay what's your share value and how some of these things impact everyone's um, feelings sure. and yeah. So see, there you go. We we tied, to, and I, I have one more section I want to get to before we run out mm -hmm. of time, although we could probably talk about this for quite a while, mm -hmm. but is the fact that there's hope. <laughs> so if That's you, right. if you didn't get this or you're listening to this going, I actually, you know what? I don't have a good read on what my mm -hmm. emotions are and how they connect mm -hmm. to things. There's hope. It doesn't mean you're doomed because you didn't get trained in that as a mm -hmm. kid but that it's work just like anything else in a muscle. And uh, yeah, I, I know that was one of the things that, you know, I had, when we had originally talked, this is a consumer grade thing that yes, it's mm -hmm. for enterprises, but it's also something that as an individual, you can experience this and sign up and participate in it and kind of mm -hmm. start connecting the dots between your emotions and how that relates to your performance. The other piece I want to get to before we run out of time mm -hmm. is how you talked a little bit about AI and technology and how mm -hmm. this comes into play. And I think one of the things that I'm really curious your take on this is how that role comes into here. Because one of the things we just talked about is the human side of things mm -hmm. is really, really important and fine tuning that. I think if anything, technology is only going to require us to even further elevate the importance of getting that side right. But how do you see some of these emerging technologies and AI playing a role in this? Because in some ways I see, I think I've heard people see it as a threat. Yeah. And in other ways, in the way I look at it is, I look at it as, no, it's not a threat to this. If anything, it's actually opening up capacity for us to spend more time on this aspect of things. That's right. Yeah. Um, so like any technology is depending on how we how we use it and um, how we leverage them to the right extent and then how the people producing the making the technology intentionally think about the, the positive impact or negative impact of it with AI what it can do it can for example as you type in the, the answers it can analyze what you what you're typing and figure out like what kind of sentiment or emotions you are so uh, when we're in the moment of getting emotional hijack and someone might be typing in an email or a message and say like, my colleague just sent me an, an email that's very, uh, that's very disrespectful <laughs> and I, I'm responding this way. So doing, using sentiment anal analysis can identify, okay, there is the uh, uh, angry emotion. We can, we can let you know so that at least you're aware that you might be in, in this situation. I or, love this example that you're bringing up because this is such a really good, because again, I think sometimes people struggle understanding like where are the practical applications of this? And the one you yeah. just described, I think anybody who ends up listening or watching this can relate to that time where you've read an email <laughs> that just emotionally hijacked you yeah, and you just angry mash up your response and you hit send without even thinking only to go oh, shoot, right? You can't take it back because you already fired it back. And what you right. just described there is the technology can start seeing that sentiment and go, hang on a second. This email reads really, really like angry. Even the prompt of, did you mean it to sound angry? And even things like, do you, are you sure you want to send this? Like yeah. based on the email you're about to fire back, I'm at least going to give you a prompt to ask you, are you sure? To make you kind of recognize like, wait a minute, I'm hijacked right now. Maybe now is not the best time mm -hmm. to hit send. I mean, I remember that was a practice. I had a mentor early on in my career go, if you're right. pissed, 
wait 10 minutes yeah. before you send an email. Like yeah. don't send an email until you've written it, take 10 minutes. And then if you still feel like what you wrote, and I can tell you in those 10 minutes, so often I end up going back being like, oh, either I just delete the whole thing <laughs> or I'm like, I'm just going to set up a 20 minute meeting and just talk to them face to face type of a thing. Because boss, to your, to your point, this is such an important area where email is so impersonal. There's no nuances. There's words. People are reading intent. And if you're yes. emotionally hijacked and firing something off, to your point, this is a great place where AI can kind of go almost be that virtual assistant that's like, uh... <laughs> Exactly. Are you sure? Yeah. Um, and also another scenario is like we, we want to aggregate some of those wisdoms of your, uh, of your mentor or like experts, leader, industry leaders, uh, certified coaches, like kind of giving people some of these recommendations when, when they don't have anyone around them to help. At least they can uh, use our product and yeah. then get some recommendations like, okay, I'm very stressed out because I had an argument with my uh boss or or because i i screwed up a project with a customer what do i do then we can give them okay here are some recommended uh resources uh videos okay. articles that at least you can start kind of uh addressing some of these issues before you can talk to anyone else so that that could be another kind of 24 7 accessible resources there for for somebody well, and I'm thinking, and, and just even as I'm thinking about, I mean, again, one of the things AI is fantastic at is mm -hmm. identifying, recognizing patterns, mm -hmm. you know, being That's able right. to see things and being able to quickly go whoop faster than even we can catch mm -hmm. it. And again, some of the things that you're doing in the product of being able to pulse, Hey, how are you feeling today? Mm -hmm. Why? Right. Well, you start layering AI on top of that, and it can start to look for these patterns of That's right. you're consistently feeling this way, and it's tied to these things. Maybe there's a development opportunity there. Maybe there's exactly. something that you can do to get better at this so that we can reduce that. And then again, AI is going to be much better at following the pattern of, mm -hmm. does that get better? Does this improve? Did that help you? you know, respond well to this. Because again, I think sometimes we, we like to see this as, well, nobody can do that quite like a human. Mm. True, maybe not on a personal level, but no human has the capacity to, mm. I can't follow you around right. and literally analyze every email you wrote, analyze every feeling that you have. Like, I don't have that kind of time. Yeah. So even if you had a one-on-one -on -one coach, they can't be there for you every second of the day where AI can actually help identify this and then be augmented with a human in the loop to help you with that. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we can aggregate um, what someone is doing and then show them the patterns and give them the, the trends and analysis. Like you said, some of those could be done with even without AI, but then AI can make it, make it better, um, generate more insights. And then we can also do that from an organizational standpoint, if we can get the data from uh, the employees of an organization, we can also surface yeah. some of the trends of an organization. It seems uh, a good number of people are stressed out because of these similar reasons. Is that something we can do to help uh, improve improve uh, the condition for this so everyone can, can yeah. be at their highest performing state? So yeah, and then <laughs> at some point we can probably aggregate data from multiple organizations and kind of see more high level trends as, yeah. as well. Well, and I think that's all one of the, you know, there's there's no shortage of doom and gloom. And I and there's some valid risks associated mm -hmm. with AI. I one hundred percent am, you know, have many concerns about the ethics and mm -hmm. you know risks associated with AI. But at the same time, when we think about even just what you described and how you're bringing emotions to the forefront, which mm -hmm. as machines take on more and more of this stuff, the responsibility of the people is going to be more and more on the human interaction, the communication, mm -hmm. the relational piece of this, that there's a lot of dysfunction. And that's where to me, when, you know, as I got to know you and what you were doing with this, I thought, you know, this is a great way, a really powerful way. Cause a lot of times, we don't deal with the feelings side of development and work. Mm -hmm. We deal with mm -hmm. the tactical step-by-step -step emotion, you know, non-emotional stuff, technical stuff. Um, so this was, this was extremely helpful.
Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate. Uh, I mean, it's always helpful to hear from industry leader, thought leader like yourself to kind of think about uh, these problems together and brainstorm. So appreciate yeah. that. Well, if people want to learn more, like I said, we, we mentioned it earlier, you can sign up for free and just check mm -hmm. out the platform. Um, but then any, any way they can follow up with you? Yes. Um, so our website is emotionsinc.com, A-M-O-T-I-O-N-S-I-N-C.com. And then my email is pnpn at emotionsinc.com. And you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, okay. PNPN Shika Free. So uh, we'd love to hear from you hear a feedback. Uh, we looking for people to try a product to give feedback as well. So we also love to awesome. hear more from you. What are your challenges and how, how we can kind of brainstorm and address these things together as well. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. This was a great conversation. And again, some really good food for thought for folks. If you're, if you're not leaning into this emotional development, um, with your folks. It's an important one. It's no shortage of dysfunction in this, and it's only going to become more important. So thank you for your time, PNPN, and thanks everybody for listening and watching. We will see you next week.